And the scripture reading, as you see it there on the screen, in the nicely presented style, two words. The shortest verse in the Holy Scriptures, John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. Not only is that the scripture reading, but that is also the title for the topic of presentation today. And so we go back in the era of ancient time, back into Bible times and back beyond Bible times, long, long ago, for a reading regarding some events that occurred way back in those times. Where I'm reading now from the story of redemption, page 13, a remarkably good book that I think every Seventh-day Adventist ought to read at least once, at least once in a lifetime. Lucifer in heaven, before his rebellion, was a high and exalted angel. His countenance, like those of the other angels, was mild and expressive of happiness. His forehead was high and broad, showing a perfect intellect. His form was perfect. His bearing was noble and majestic. A special light beamed in his countenance and shone around him, brighter and more beautiful than around the other angels. He gloried in his loftiness, and he aspired to the height of God himself. Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. He left the immediate presence of the Father dissatisfied and filled with envy against Jesus. There was contention among the angels. Lucifer and his sympathizers were striving to reform the government of God. They rebelled against the authority of the Son. Angels that were loyal and true sought to reconcile this mighty, rebellious angel to the, to the will of his Creator. They anxiously sought, anxiously sought to move him to renounce his wicked design and to yield submission to their Creator. I read on, direct quote, the angels wept. All heaven seemed to be in commotion. The angels were marshaled into companies, each division with a higher commanding angel at its head. God declared that the rebellious should remain in heaven no longer. Then there was war in heaven. The Son of God, the Prince of Heaven, and his loyal angels engaged in conflict with the arch rebel and those who united with him. The Son of God and true loyal angels prevailed, and Satan and his sympathizers were expelled from heaven. On earth, Satan stood in amazement at his new condition. An angel from heaven was passing. Lucifer called to him and entreated to him to obtain an interview with Jesus. This interview was granted. Lucifer then related to the Son of God that he was willing to take the place that God had previously assigned to him. Christ told him that heaven must not be placed in jeopardy. All heaven would be marred if he should be received back. I read on a direct quotation. Jesus wept. And before we continue in this significant, interesting, historic information, we pause for an affirmation in the things of faith. And I read from the writings found in the scriptures and in the writings that we as the denomination have for the privilege of access to. And I read, from, I read from Isaiah 44, verse 22. God says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sins. Steps to Christ, as you draw near to God with confession and repentance, he will draw near to you with mercy and forgiveness. Paul and Romans, blessed are they whose sins are forgiven. 
Chronicles. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Steps to Christ again. Every step in life may bring us closer to Jesus, may give us a deeper experience of his love, and may bring us one step nearer to the blessed home of peace. And so we take another reading, this time not in the past, but in the future, to a certain extent in the future. But let's look at the information that is given. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, speaking about a judgment day. It is appointed unto men once to die. Yeah, at my age and your age, I'm painfully aware of that possibility. It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment, education, supportive information, everyone must in the judgment give account of himself to God. Paul in Corinthians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Testimonies, the people must be warned to prepare for the coming judgment. This is serious business. Ecclesiastes, God will bring every work into judgment. And those things of the past, keep them in the past forgiven. Judgment day is coming. Now the judgment itself. Great Controversy 436. The work of judgment began in 1844. And it must continue until the cases of all are decided. The living and the dead. There was a large company that were gathered together and suddenly the heavens gathered blackness. The thunders rolled, the lightnings flashed, and a voice louder than the heaviest peals of thunder sounded through the heavens and the earth saying, It is finished. Part of the company with pallid faces sprang forward with a wail of agony crying out, I am not ready. The cry was ringing in my ears, says the author. I am not ready. I'm unsaved. Lost. Lost. Eternally lost. The great day of the execution of God's judgment seemed to have come. 10,000 times 10,000 were assembled before a large throne upon which was seated a person of majestic appearance. Several books were before him, and upon the covers of each was written in letters of gold, which seemed like a burning flame of fire, ledger of heaven. They don't speak English in heaven. That's part of the territory of planet Earth where we speak that language. But the translation of it on that ledger read, Ledger of Heaven. One of these books containing the names of those who claimed to believe the truth was then open. People like you and me. As these persons were named one by one and their good deeds mentioned, their countenances would light up with a holy joy that was reflected in every direction. Aren't you glad your sins are forgiven? Aren't you glad you can rejoice in the ministry of salvation? The great day of the execution of God's judgment seemed to have come. Yes, the names were mentioned. Another book was opened wherein were recorded the sins of those who profess the truth. Sins of Adventists? You've got to be kidding. Under the general heading of selfishness came every other sin. There were also headings over every column. And underneath these, opposite each name, were recorded in their respective columns the lesser sins. Under covetousness came falsehood. Theft, robbery, fraud, avarice. Under ambition came pride and extravagance. Jealousy stood at the head of malice, envy, hatred. And intemperance headed a long list of fearful crimes, such as lasciviousness, adultery, indulgence of animal passion, etc. 
And like I say when I'm reading this information to an Adventist congregation, this is the only place in the entire spirit of prophecy where the word etc., Latin, et cetera, and so forth, is given, E-T-C. As the Holy One upon the throne slowly turned the leaves of the ledger and his eyes rested for a moment upon individuals, his glance seemed to burn into their very souls. And at the same moment, every word and every action of their lives passed before their minds as clearly as though traced before their vision in letters of fire. Trembling seized them and their faces turned pale. A dread is upon every soul, lest he should be found among those who are wanting. Every eye is riveted upon the face of the one upon the throne, and as his solemn, searching eye sweeps over that company, there is a quaking of heart, for they are self-condemned without one word being uttered. In anguish of soul, each declares his own guilt, and with terrible vividness sees that by sinning, he has thrown away the precious boon of eternal life. This class had made self supreme, laboring only for selfish interests. The names of all who professed the truth were mentioned. The names of all Seventh-day Adventists. That life of bliss, says Jesus, which I purchased for you at such a cost, you have disregarded. The privileges that he died to bring within your reach have not been appreciated. And I continue with this information. Then were uttered those solemn words, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. The book was then closed. And the mantle fell from the person on the throne, revealing the terrible glory of the Son of God. And thus far in presentation, three topics of significant importance. The fall of Lucifer in heaven 6,000 years ago. Affirmation of faith, forgiveness for sin for us today. Judgment Day is coming. Now we look at some of the information that is associated with this particular topic. First of all, Jesus created everything, everything in our entire universe. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. New King James Version, for a little touch of variety. For by him, that is by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven, or the heavens, plural, and that are on earth. All things were created by him. The Gospel of John chapter 1 and the third verse, all things were made by Jesus. Hebrews, the writings of Paul. In these last days, okay, for us today, in this, these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, through whom he made the universe. Great controversy says the same thing. You'd expect that, and yes, it is there. Jesus created and upheld the unnumbered worlds throughout the entire vast realms of space. Selected messages, four words, Christ made everything. Christ made all things. Patriarchs and prophets, the Son of God, Jesus, wrought the Father's will in the creation of all the hosts of heaven. Now we look at the fall of Lucifer. And uh, you might like to turn this up in the book of Ezekiel. You have read these things before. It has been presented in evangelistic meetings and sometimes pastoral presentations in the information that is given in the worship services. And we're looking now at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Sort of easy to remember because Isaiah has 14 and then two books on Ezekiel 
gives us 28. And when you look at this book here, with this information, you see the, that which is stated in the scriptures regarding these circumstances. And we are looking at verses 12 through 15. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Say unto him, you sealed up the sum of your beauty and so forth. 13, you have been in Eden, the garden of God, up there in heaven, not the one on earth that is referred to here. All of the, the, the uh, precious stones. 14, you are the anointed cherub that covers. I have set thee upon the holy mountain. 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found within you. There have been but three people living upon planet Earth who have lived without sin. Three people only. One was Jesus after his birth and his life, and the other two were Adam and Eve before they committed sin. They uh, disobeyed the Lord and went into the ways of iniquity. So that's the story there of Lucifer in that circumstance. Now, Isaiah 14, 12 through 16. Isaiah chapter 14. And looking at verses... Isaiah 14, looking at verses 12 through 16. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 13. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Ambition, unholy ambition. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars of God are the angels. He wanted to uh, ascend into heaven to be like God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north where they have their big meetings and deliberations. I will ascend above the kites of the clouds. I will be like the most high, not in character, in position, in domination, and in control. That's the reason, one of the reasons why within our denomination we don't have a dictatorship. We have a different form of government whereby others involved in these things have an opportunity and a privilege to know the way of life. The fall of Lucifer, we know that he was expelled. He did go to other planets without success. And in fact, on one occasion, when he visited another planet, the people there thought he was God himself, but it didn't work. And then he came to the Garden of Eden story. Now we look at some other information with which, again, you are very familiar. The Gospel of John now in the New Testament. And as soon as we think of the Gospel of John and the words of Scripture that are the two isolated words in a particular verse, the shortest words of the, uh, the shortest verse, verse of the Bible, Jesus wept, we realize that this is associated with the story of Lazarus. You might like to look at this in the Holy Scriptures because there's some very significant and very interesting information. The story of Lazarus, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. First one, a certain man was sick, Lazarus, Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, three siblings in the one family. Lazarus was the younger, youngest in that. Verse three, uh, they, uh, Lazarus had become sick, verse two at the end says his brother, the, the uh, sister's brother, Lazarus, was sick. Verse three, the sister sent a message to Jesus saying, Lord, Behold, he whom you love is sick. But just a moment, doesn't God, doesn't Jesus love all earthlings? Is, does the Bible not say God is love as the supreme empathy in the entire universe? Does God not love all of his people, you and me, younger or older? Well, this is the statement in the scriptures. Yes, Jesus loved Lazarus. We might say also. And then uh, Jesus referred to this, verse 4. Then uh, verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha 
and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus also. And then when he, verse 6, he heard therefore that he was sick, he deliberately abode two days in the same place. And he was over there in Arab Amman, or Arab Jordan, on the other side of the river. And he deliberately stayed there a little longer. And uh, verse 8, his disciples said to him, um, or verse 7, after a period of time, Jesus said, let's go now to Judea. The two days had passed. And the disciples said, look, if we go there, it's a death sentence for you and for us. Verse 9, Jesus said, all will be well. Verse 10, if it's day, let's go. Verse 11, these things said Jesus. And after that, he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth but I wake him out of sleep. And you go down to verse 14. Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Get the picture, you people, he was saying. I'm trying to tell you, Lazarus is dead. Verse 15, and I am glad. Hold it. Jesus said when his close relative and loyal friend was dead, he said, I am glad. You've got to be kidding. Lord Jesus, pardon me for saying so, but I think you've got your emotions mixed up a little. Just a little, you know. When someone is dead, like your close relative, your loyal friend Lazarus, you should be sad, not glad. John 11:35. you know what happened? Jesus went to, to Bethany, just a close, well, a distant walk from Jerusalem, and arrived there, went to the tomb, and then when he went out to the tomb, John 35, John 11:35, Jesus wept. In German, auf Deutsch, die Heilige Schriften sagte, Jesus ging in ihm die Augen über. In Greek, the language of the New Testament, it actually sent Paul Jesus. In Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, Jesus Baca. In Latin, the first translation of the Bible into a foreign language, Lacrimatus Jesus. In Urdu, our language when we were in Pakistan, Kitabi Mukadasme, Yesu ke Ansu Bane Lage. In Espanol, Jesus, Loro. Tagalog, Umiyaxi, Jesus. In Esperanto, the universal auxiliary language, in La Sancta Biblio, Jesu, Larmis. Regardless of the language that you think in, regardless of the language you pray in, it's still the same meaning. Two words, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus weep? Desire of Ages 5.24. The Savior loves all the human family. I, I mentioned that a little earlier. God is love. Jesus loves the entire human family. Wicked, righteous, sinner, saint. But he does want salvation for all sinners. Yes. The Savior loves all the human family, desire of ages. Another statement in desire of ages, Jesus suffered every pang of sorrow that Mary and Martha suffered. Yes, Jesus really was sad when uh, Lazarus died. Desire of ages 5.28, to all who are reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God, the moment of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is nearest. When you don't feel well, when you're facing medical problems, problems that will never ever get better, I read this again. To all who are reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God, the moment of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is nearest. Same book again. Jesus did not weep for Lazarus. John 11:35. it was on the screen. Jesus wept. 
the spirit of prophecy says, Jesus did not weep for Lazarus, for he was about to call him from the grave. He knew four days in the grave, and he's coming out again. He was not weeping for Lazarus. Everybody thought so, but they got their information wrong. They judged incorrectly in this particular circumstance, and I guess a lot of other times as well. Why did Jesus weep? I read the answer on Desire of Ages, page 534. The weight of the grief of the ages was upon Jesus. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. That's why Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. There were people there who were ready to trap him. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, they scattered off, went back to Jerusalem and reported to the political and religious leaders of the nations. Do you want to know what he's done next? He raised a man from the dead. He was dead. They, he raised him from death. They said, we've got to put this guy, we've got to end it for him. And one week later, he was dead. Salvation ministry was in the heart of Jesus in these things. Now, Thus far, we have seen that the angels wept when Lucifer defected, that Jesus, when he was talking with Lucifer the last occasion, telling him there's no way we can take you back in heaven, it's over, you've crossed the line backwards, Jesus wept. Here Jesus wept at the occasion of the death of Lazarus, but he was weeping for the human race and for the majority of people who don't want the ways of salvation. Be grateful that in the divine providence, the ways of salvation have come to you, little children as well as older ones. And in fact, I remember talking in uh, one of our Adventist churches here in Indiana many years ago. There was a little girl about the same age as this one here sitting on the floor in the middle of the aisle. And uh, as I spoke regarding the information about the ways of salvation, I said to her directly, do you understand these things? And she nodded her head and she said yes. The way of salvation is available for the smallest, the way of salvation is available for the oldest. Now
Notice what else is stated in the, script, in the scriptures. Isaiah 28, 21. The Lord will bring to pass his act, his strange act. Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God made the angels. He made Lucifer. He made the human race. Revelation 21, verse 4. This verse says, this verse says, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Yes, and we say that applies to us. We go to heaven and all weeping and crying is over. Largely that's true. But let's remember, this verse of scripture is found at the very end of the Holy Bible. It is at the end of the uh, information that is given in the book of Revelation, and it's in the timing of the death of the wicked around the New Jerusalem. When the wicked are destroyed by fire coming down from God out of heaven, there will be people that you know that have been resurrected to face judgment of God in this particular way. Family members, a few church fellow, fellow church members maybe, friends, relatives, workmates, people you know, you, some that you didn't like so well, others that you knew and appreciated, people that you were closely linked with, relatives and family members. And when they are destroyed, this is the time when Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4 is applied. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. When they are dying, when they are being destroyed with fire from God out of heaven, you will weep your eyes out. You will weep your heart out. People you have known and loved. Real people. But after that is over, God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. And then there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. That is the end of all things. And so Jesus wept. That's the topic for the day. When Lucifer defected, the angels in heaven wept. At the time when Lucifer asked for an interview with Jesus at the Garden of Eden, and it was granted to him, Jesus told him, it's too late. You've crossed the line backwards. And Jesus wept. At the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus wept, not for Lazarus because he was going to raise him from the dead, but for the whole world in sin. At the time of the second death of the wicked, you will weep because of the people that you have known and loved who did not make it into eternity. God is love. John 12, 47. Jesus said, I came into the world not to judge, not to criticize, not to condemn the world, but to save it. That's why he came, he said. And all we can say is we need to ensure that we secure our own faith and that we spread the word. Like you're planning to do in the next few days at the fair. Now, the opening hymn a little while ago